CPUs with integrated graphics always make memory interesting. Memory's commoditization, ignoring recent price trends, has made it an item where you sort of pick what's cheap and just buy it. With something like AMD's Ravenridge APUs, that memory choice could have a lot more impact than in a budget gaming PC with a discrete GPU. We'll be testing a handful of memory kits with the R5 2400G in today's content, including single versus dual channel testing, where all timings have been properly equalized. We're also testing a few different motherboards with the same kits of memory, useful for determining how timings change between boards, and we'll be getting through gaming benchmarks primarily today, rather than anything with synthetics. Before that, this video is brought to you by EVGA and the X299 Dark motherboard for the Intel high-end desktop CPUs. The X299 Dark is one of the only motherboards on the market with proper VRM cooling. We've tested this and found significant performance increase over those without active cooling on the VRMs. This board was used in our recent attempt to set a top 10 record in Firestrike, and you can learn more about the X299 Dark at the link in the description below. The only place we're making use of synthetics will be between switching boards for the most part with Firestrike and TimeSpy. This is where synthetics shine. We're avoiding things like Cinebench or non-synthetic production workloads like Blender because they just don't really fit the content. We're going for how does memory impact gaming performance with the Raven Ridge APUs. So to that end, it's not like we're testing every mem memory kit on the market, but we're going through a lot of them and covering everything from 2400 up to 3200 megahertz. And we'll just kind of see how it looks and then decide what we're doing for future content pieces from there. We're splitting these benchmarks into two sections. First, we'll show the impact of various memory kits on performance when tested on a Gigabyte Gaming K5 motherboard. And then we'll move over to demonstrate how a few popular motherboards affect results when left to auto XMP timings. We're focusing on memory scalability performance today with a baseline provided by the previously tested G4560 and R3-1200 with GT1030 that we ran a few weeks ago. We'll get to APU overclocking in a future content piece, but for now we're just looking at memory performance. For single channel testing, we're benchmarking the best kit that we have out of all the tests we ran, which is the Trident Z CL14 3200MHz option, and then we'll look at a couple of the others along the way. Rocket League at 1080p and high-ish settings will start us out. For this one, our R5-2400G operated a 58 FPS average with 3200MHz CL14 Trident Z memory from G-Skill, and the 0.1% lows tagged along at 18 FPS. The GT1030 and G4560 would be a good baseline here for comparison, performing at about 62 FPS average, but with significantly improved frame times. Remember, the memory for an APU is shared between the GPU and CPU components. When the GPU component on an APU needs to access memory, it's going to system memory. There's no onboard memory like you have with GDDR5 or HBM2. And because of that, we're dealing with different types of memory. There is a significant difference between GDDR5, which is physically on the board, it has tighter timings typically, and it's technically a bit faster for the specific task. Also, it's physically closer to the GPU than an APU where it has to travel across part of the motherboard basically. So uh, this is where the differences start to emerge with memory and it's why memory is so important with APUs, particularly when you're talking dual versus single channel. This is something that, as we've shown recently, doesn't really mean a whole lot when you use a DGPU and a low-end CPU. You could run one stick or two sticks and as we've shown, in a lot of cases, it really doesn't matter that much. However, for something like an APU, it can matter a whole lot as we've just shown here. And that's because the APU actually really needs access to memory because the GPU otherwise would be starved for it. It's accessing system memory, it's shared memory between the CPU and the GPU. And so it needs to be fast enough to support both of those devices simultaneously. Back to the Rocket League chart, keep in mind that our focus today again is memory. So we'll get to APU overclocking in a later content piece. Getting down to the memory comparison on the R5 APU, the next best performing kit after the CL14 Trident Z was our Corsair LPX memory that AMD provided with the R7 last year, operating at 2933 MHz and CL16. The next one down was our Guile kit, also provided by AMD, but for the R5 launch, operating at 3200 MHz and CL16. In this instance, however, there's more different than just the top level cast timings. We'll get to those toward the end of the content, as it's decidedly more boring than FPS numbers for most. Scalability has us ranking the LPX and Guile kits within margin of error of one another, effectively equal in performance. 
The 2400 MHz CL15 Ripjaws 5 memory from years ago operated at about 48 FPS average, marking the top to bottom range of performance as about 9 FPS between the Trident Z and the Ripjaws kit. That plants the 3200 MHz CL14 Trident Z kit as 19.8% ahead of the Ripjaws kit, and the Ripjaws unit also dropped frame times further landing at 13 FPS, 0.1% lows. Finally, our single channel test takes the best kit, the Trident Z CL14 memory, and tests it with only one channel firing. This lands us at 31 FPS, placing the dual channel Trident Z kit at about 80% ahead in performance. We nearly double performance by operating in two channels, or in most cases, adding a stick of memory if you're considering buying one versus two, so far, with only one data point, it looked like builders of APU systems will definitely want to go dual channel and dual stick, even if it's a couple dollars more. The difference tends to be five to 10 bucks, so it's worth it here. For Dota 2, we test at high settings and 1080p using DirectX 11. Note that AMD Ryzen CPUs have traditionally fallen behind in this particular game, so we would anticipate that performance behavior would follow through on Raven Ridge. This is more a factor of Dota 2 and how it's built, as it favors frequency over threads in a lot of cases. Regardless, our two GT1030 tests were bound by the GPU, topping out at 63 FPS average. The R5 2400G with Trident Z memory maintained an average of 45 FPS, with lows somewhat low at 19 FPS. The 2933 MHz LPX kit falls in second place again for the second time, with the Ripjaws 5 kit outpacing our Guile CL16 memory by a few FPS. The stack places the Trident Z and LPX memory as functionally tied and within error margins, with the Guile kit not far behind. Going single channel nuked performance, bringing output down to 25 FPS from 45 FPS, granting the dual channel configuration a 79% lead over the single channel configuration. Lows aren't much different, but that's largely a factor of how this game generally behaves. For CSGO with relatively high settings at 1080p, the baseline tests operated around 111 to 120 FPS average, with our highest performing R5 2400G non-overclocked at 95 FPS with the Trident Z memory. Note also that the R5's lows maintain a much healthier number this time, marked at 41 FPS for 0.1% and 63 FPS for 1% lows, CSGO is fully playable on the R5 2400G and maintains a consistent frame-to-frame -frame interval during gameplay. The next component was, once again, the Corsair LPX at 2933 MHz with CL16 timings, allowing the Trident Z to lead by about 5.9%. The Guile kits rank roughly within error of the Ripjaws 2400 MHz kit, further demonstrating that this particular kit of memory doesn't play as well with this specific motherboard. Keep in mind that explicit motherboard tuning for validated memory kits can impact performance, so other boards may behave differently. It's entirely possible that one board would not like the Trident Z kit at all, but love the Guile kit, and vice versa. The Ripjaws 5 2400 MHz kit places last, about 10 FPS behind the Trident Z kit, which results in a lead of about 12% for the Trident Z memory. Pulling up Newegg, the price difference is about $230 for the Trident Z kit at 16GB, or about $165 for the Ripjaws 5 kit that we used previously. Again, that's at 16 gigabytes and strictly comparing the exact two kits that we own. Back to the chart, single channel testing had us at 52 FPS average, with 0.1% lows significantly reduced. We have more frame time variance here than previously. We're about 83% ahead with the dual channel alternative Trident Z kit. Sniper Elite 4 gives us a DirectX 12 test with async compute, and one which has been exceptionally well optimized, especially for AMD. We're testing at 1080p high, as that's what we have the most data for with standard GPU benchmarks. Note that, of course, you'd probably dial down to medium for actual gameplay, but we're just looking at scaling today. For this benchmark, we observed the 2400G outperforming the GT1030 and G4560 combination notably, which comes down to an AMD advantage with Sniper Elite's asynchronous compute pipeline, particularly on the Vega graphics chip. The Trident Z CL14 kit ranks about 30 FPS average, with it lows tightly behind, and the 2933 MHz kit CL16 nearly tied in performance. We're beginning to bump against other limitations here. The CL14 Trident Z kit again lands 12-13% to ahead of the 2400 MHz Ripjaws 5 kit, and the Guile kit again demonstrates poor performance from its auto timings on this board. Single channel performance is significantly behind as well, just like previously. And just briefly, here's an Overwatch chart as well. We'll talk about this more in the article below, 
but there's not much to say here. It's more of the same scaling that we've seen previously when tested at medium settings with 1080p. Fire Strike gives us a synthetic recap to look at everything, including a quick test we did with a 1650 MHz overclock on the APU's Vega 11 GPU, which roughly equals or slightly underperforms against the GT 1030. As for memory performance, the Trident Z kit lands our total score about 3289, which is about 3% ahead of the Corsair LPX kit, or about 5.8% ahead of the Guile kit, and about 11.6% ahead of the 2400 MHz Ripdos 5 kit. Versus a single channel, we see a marked uplift of 59% in total score, and depending on whether you're looking at GPU or CPU, that may increase or decrease. For Time Spy, we'll just briefly mention that the overclocked Vega 11 component does well to place ahead of the GT1030 build, but we'll talk about that more in a later piece. Focusing back on memory, the Trident Z kit places our total score at 1255, which ranks about 11% ahead of the Guile 3200 MHz kit that AMD provided for the R5 review, or about 3% ahead of the 2933 kit. Once again, single versus dual channel configurations have a tremendous impact on performance, as you can see here. Moving on from this, the next test is pretty simple, really. We didn't go crazy in depth on it. You could really go off the deep end here and test every motherboard on the market if you wanted to. All we did was take three or four popular motherboards that we happened to have and run the same two kits, Guile and Trident Z, through Firestrike and Time Spy with an R5 2400G. The entire point of this is to determine if the boards behave any differently, uh, if they have different auto timings applied when you just apply XMP, because it doesn't always apply the same settings every single time. And we have a separate table for that after we get through these last two charts to show the maybe one or two instances where those numbers are actually different, aside from just saying the word auto. For Time Spy, the Gigabyte Gaming K5 with Trident Z memory ranked again at 1255 for its combined score with the Pro 4 from ASRock within our margin of error. These two are effectively equal, and the MSI Tomahawk scored at 1230 for the Trident Z kit, giving us a top to bottom scoring of 2% difference. Firestrike positions the Gigabyte Gaming K5 at the top, but also completely within error of the ASRock Pro 4. We were within about 1% of performance, and so these boards apply timings in a way that makes them perform functionally equivalently. The Tomahawk P350 board lands the Trident Z kit also close behind, and between these three boards, there's nothing crazy going on in score. They're all about the same. There's a slight difference in timings, though. Here's a simplified spreadsheet on the motherboard auto timings for the Trident Z kit. Note that, of course, Different memory kits may have very different results here. The Trident Z kit is fairly popular, and so most boards have explicit support of this memory. Our main difference is in TRFC, as shown here, though that doesn't manifest in huge ways in these quick synthetics. As for memory timing settings on the main Gaming K5 motherboard, we'll publish those in the article linked below. So the main takeaway here is, well, one, single versus dual channel does actually matter a lot with APUs. That's not really news. Uh, and it's not quite so important for something like a low-end CPU with a DGPU. We did that test a few months ago, and for that configuration, it didn't really matter. But for this one, it does, and that's because of how APUs work, because there's no onboard memory with it. So if you are buying, it doesn't matter what kit of memory you're buying, if you're planning to play games with an APU, which you probably are, that's what they're targeted at, then we would suggest find the kit of memory you want, and then find the version that has two sticks. So you maybe two by four. If you're going with an eight gigabyte stick, buy two four gigabyte sticks instead, go dual channel, it will help, it will matter. And oftentimes it's five to $10 more for two by four instead of one by eight, if that. Might even be a couple bucks cheaper, it depends on the kit of memory. As for the frequency, it's obviously not quite as simple as just frequency, timings matter the most and uh, more than just the couple, like four or five top level timings, sub timings in AMD boards, can get kind of screwy depending on what board you're using. So there's a lot of play there. We can't test for every scenario, but the G-Skill Trident Z kit did really well in our testing. It's also pretty expensive. In fact, it's, it's kind of exiting the price range of what's reasonable to buy with an APU. If you're spending that much on memory, you almost might as well just get a DGPU and a cheap CPU. So you might have to dial it back a bit. The good news is, even coming down from that expensive kit of memory, there's not a whole lot of range in uh, the following sort of one to two kits that we tested. The Corsair 2933 kit that we got a year ago from AMD for Ryzen, because it was at the time the only validated kit for Ryzen, that kit did pretty well here. 
It's often roughly tied with the Trident Z kit. It's reasonably affordable. And G-Skill has good Rip Jaws kits that are faster than the old 2400 one we tested here. You pick one of those up. The point is, until you really get down to like 2400, 2666 megahertz, you're not losing a ton of performance. So if the difference is significant in price, which it can be, especially for countries that aren't the US where uh, prices, we've looked at them, and memory prices are kind of crazy there too. But if the price difference is significant between, I don't know, 2933 and 3200, just get 2933, it's, it's fine. You can apply that money better towards something else. Because the minute you're spending an extra $20 on memory, you're really getting into territory where a low-end CPU and a DGPU with lower end memory would be better value for your money. But if you are somewhere, I mean, the US sometimes has about the same price between 3,200 and 2,666. If you're in that situation, I, don't, it's, I guess just buy the better one because it does actually matter a bit. So yeah, uh, not, not world ending differences in the uh, two primary use cases that we tested, the LPX and the Trident Z, but pretty significant differences between the Trident Z and the Rip Jaws 2400 megahertz kit. So that's where it starts to come into play. And those timings were pretty close. So you are starting to look at a, a raw frequency difference to some extent there. And again, uh, this isn't the most comprehensive in the world that you could do because there's a lot of memory. There are a lot of motherboards. They all kind of play a little bit differently, do your own research, all that stuff. But hopefully this gives you a starting point and some basic concepts as to what really matters with the Raven Ridge APUs. And as always, you can subscribe for more coverage of these APUs, or you go to store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to help us out directly by buying one of our restocked mugs. I think we have hats coming in too. And uh, patreon.com slash gamersnexus to help us out other ways. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more. I'll see you all next time.